Mr. Parr, I'm the chairman of the subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties, so this is most pertinent hearing to me. Firstly, I'd like to ask you if you will uh, work with us and allow the head of the Civil Rights Division, Assistant Attorney General Eric uh, Dryband, to testify before this committee this fall. I'll talk to him about it. it we encourage him. I'll talk to him about it. All right. I closely watched actions taken by the federal government in Lafayette Park in June and currently in Portland, Oregon. According to a DOJ document dated June 4, received by this committee, 1,500 federal agents from 10 different agencies were deployed to confront protesters in Washington, D.C. At Lafayette Park, which has long been honored and accepted as a place of protest in our nation's capital, on the first day of June, the world watched in horror on live television as federal agents deployed by the administration and with you present and telling him to get it done, used force to clear Lafayette Park so that the president, with you and others at your side, could walk across the park and have a photo op in front of St. John's Church. This was anathema to the bishop of the diocese and the rector of the church. It was also an affront to the Constitution and to the American people. Giving the timing and the coordinated attack against the peaceful demonstrators, it strains credulity that this was not planned for use of political purposes. And just yesterday, Major DeMarco testified to another committee of Congress that the protesters were peaceful, and that's what the most the majority of people have said, and the response was excessive. When did you first learn that the president planned to walk through the park and go to St. John's Church? First, I'd like to respond to what you Let, Would you please answer my question? My time is limited. I learned uh, sometime in the afternoon that the president uh, might come out of the White House, and then later in the afternoon I heard that he might go over to the church. So it was absolutely necessary the park be cleared for his for his walk. No, that's, that had nothing to do with that. The plan to move Mr. Mr. The plan General, to move the it was necessary that the park be cleared and it was done. And you said get it done. Well, I, I have the time. Thank you. In Portland, we've seen mothers and we've seen veterans who were peacefully protesting, not threatening the federal courthouse, beaten and gassed. Unidentified armed federal agents violently attacked demonstrators in a violation of the First Amendment's freedom of assembly and arrested citizens without individualized suspicion and a violation of the Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable searches and seizures and a warrant requirement. You've gone through the Fifth Amendment and due process and just negated it. And the Tenth Amendment, which leaves general policing to the law enforcement, to the states, has been forgotten. Maybe what happened was your secret police were poorly trained, just like your Bureau of Prisons guards were poorly trained and allowed the most notorious inmate in our nation's last several years, Jeffrey Epstein, to conveniently commit suicide. Sad. You misled Congress and the American people about Special Counsel Mueller's findings with your quote summary, unquote, of his report. It was issued about a month before you released the redacted portion of the Mueller report. But you set the stage. You set the stage such that the Special Counsel objected to the accuracy of how it was reported by the press and what you said. And federal judge Reggie Walton, appointed by George W. Bush, declared in a ruling that your summary was, quote, distorted, unquote, and misleading, unquote, and that the court could not trust you. Further, Judge Walton stated your report was, quote, a calculated attempt to influence public disclosure about the Mueller report in favor of President Trump, unquote. This committee still does not have the unredacted Mueller report. America has still not seen the unredacted Mueller report. Your excuses for not releasing it because it had to do with ongoing cases no longer exist because those ongoing cases have been completed or commuted or finished. Other attorney generals work with this Judiciary Committee to see that the American public and that the Judiciary Committee had unredacted copies of that report. You have not. You've gone to court to stall it. This report needs to be given to this committee. And Michael Cohen, you've treated him differently than Michael Flynn and Roger Stone. And Michael Flynn, you've attempted to dismiss the charges, even after he twice pled guilty. And at Roger Stone, you went further. Mr. Barr, John Lewis said to us, if not me, who, if not now, when? That's why I introduced H.R.S. 1032, which would require this committee to investigate your conduct as attorney general and determine whether you should be impeached. That is my constitutional duty. I yield back the balance of my time. 
May I respond to these? Matt, seek recognition. I'm sorry, what did you... I would, the, like, to to, I would like to seek Mr. recognition Cole. for unanimous consent requests. Yes. You are Thank recognized. you. Somebody I'd like to introduce is. for the record a Slate article entitled Why Trump Chose Portland, which... Somebody is pissed. I don't mean a little. Somebody is pissed. This is one of our Tennessee representatives. Where did this come from? Have I missed something? Why are they attacking? Mr. Barr. You know, whenever it comes to and this don't look right neither. I guess maybe he's got his coat over his uh, over his chair or something. Um, but whenever it comes to people not wanting to hold responsibilities and accountabilities uh, of different agencies, man, whenever the ball gets to talk, being tossed around like a hot potato, don't it go back and forth quick and hard? Let's listen to the rest of this. This is just, the way that this guy is verbally attacking this man is just unbelievable. Describes the racial history of the state and the Portland Police Bureau. I'd also like to introduce an op-ed from Mary McCord, who writes, her words were twisted to justify the department's disingenuous position to drop charges against Michael Flynn after he had already pled guilty. I'd like to introduce an op-ed from Jonathan Cravis, describing the political interference in the Roger Stone case and why he resigned from the Department of Justice. And I'd like to introduce a statement from over 2,600 former DOJ officials calling for Attorney General Barr's resignation because of his assault on the rule of law. And a letter from the New York City Bar urging Congress to commence formal inquiries in a pattern of conduct by Attorney General Barr that threatens public confidence in the fair and impartial administration of justice. And finally, a letter from 27 of the District of Columbia's most prominent attorneys and law professors, including four past presidents of the D.C. Bar, calling for an ethics investigation into Mr. Barr's conduct. With and last but not least, a letter from over 80% of the George Washington University Law School faculty, your alma mater, saying his actions have posed to continue to create a clear and present danger to the even-handed administration of justice, to civil liberties, and the constitutional order. Okay, without objection. Thank Madam you. Chair, one more the unanimous consent request Go ahead. on this Go side. Ahead. This is the article that says, Representative Jerry Natler says Antifa violence in Portland is a myth. That's from Politico and a number of other journals. Without Put objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins is recognized for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Attorney General Barr. Wow. I, I'm beginning to believe, frankly, that you're probably the, that just hadn't come out yet, probably went a little bit, you're probably the cause of the common cold and, uh, you know, and possibly even the COVID-19, I'm not sure at this point, because everything's being thrown at you, including now, undoubtedly, your alma mater doesn't like you anymore. Where, where have we come? The chairman said something earlier today that really made me think. He said, why all the drama? That's the most ironic statement coming from this committee in the last 18 months that I've ever heard of the drama that we're bringing up today. We're, we're, we're seeming to just contort ourselves to get to uh, some way to show that you have nefarious motive. I believe, uh, like some of our side here, I believe the biggest problem you have is telling the truth. I believe that's the problem that they have with you. You'll tell the truth and you'll take the responsibility for your actions and I think that's why you're being attacked. But I want to continue just on this quote, peaceful protest for a second. You made a comment just a second ago on these rights. Talking about the courthouses just down the street, what if they decided, do you think that this body right here would rise up if they decided to go tonight and paint the Capitol building? This body, I'm not sure. I think this side would, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, this side, other side, I'm not so sure. It may be the peaceful protest to burn down the Capitol. Maybe we're back to 1812 again. But also, it, the other question I have is, and you've heard it earlier today, the stormtrooper comments by the Speaker of the House, and we know that that is a direct uh, reference to the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party, stormtroopers going at it. Do you believe that that actually puts our law enforcement community at a whole? As a son of a state trooper, I, I, I want to know your opinion. Is it, don't you think it encourages the violence that we're seeing and encourages the participation against the police? I think that's possible, and I think it's irresponsible to call 
these federal law enforcement officers, stormtroopers. Yeah, and we're seeing that thing played out over and over. Let's switch back to something else, though, that is, is I think, more appealing here. We've talked about the investigations, and uh, especially with going with Flynn. Do you believe that there was actually a basis to go after General Flynn? I mean, what we've seen so far, what's been released, and especially keeping a, an investigation open, Peter Strzok kept it open. Do you believe there's actually a basis for the beginning of this investigation to start with? Are continuing it well i would just say i i asked uh, another u.s attorney in st louis who had 10 years in the fbi and 10 years in the department of justice as a career prosecutor to take a look at it and and he determined based on documents that had not been provided to flynn's side and not been provided to the court that in fact there was no basis to investigate Okay. Flynn. And well, furthermore, it was clearly established by the documents that the FBI agents who interviewed him did not believe right. that he thought he was lying. Well, there's another part of this as well that concerns uh, what has been you know, given to the courts and, and the interviews, and that is that the facts were not disclosed to Flynn prior to the interview. We talked, do you, that seems like a Brady violation to me. Do you believe that, that was, there's a Brady violation there in this case? No, there wasn't a Brady violation there, but I think what the uh, counsel concluded was that the only purpose of the interview, the only purpose, was to try to catch him in, in saying something that they could then say was a lie. So it was an entrapment. And therefore, and, and therefore, there was not a, a legit, it, the, the interview was untethered to any legitimate uh, investigation. So as the law enforcement officer in this country, it is your responsibility to provide justice for both sides, not, you know, and, and just call it as it should be. And I think that's what you've done there. Uh, continuing on Durham case, and I know we're not talking specifically about the Durham investigation, which we're hopeful of, but to your knowledge, uh, um, and we're seeing some released documents on the last uh, week or two that have said, to your knowledge, has Kevin Kleinsmith or anyone else at FBI or DOJ attempted, who was previously there, attempted to redeem themselves by cooperating with the investigation? It's been slow, and I, I, I can't get into that. Okay. I understand that. Well, I have another issue as we finish up in looking at this between the rhetoric, between the investigation. I think Durham investigation is something most of us are waiting for because we can't seem to get this committee to actually believe that the IG's report is worth having something about this committee. And there's not a Democrat or Republican on the side that can make a legitimate claim why the inspector general has not been called before this committee to actually explain his report except politics. And that's what this committee has become all along. But I have another problem, and I've talked to you, I've written to you about this. Um, and that's down with a district attorney down in Fulton County, Georgia, actually charging, uh, making felony murder charges uh, on an officer. And the interesting part about this is what we do as is, is, is prosecutors do, but the, were you aware that the district attorney failed to seek an indictment from a grand jury or even waited for a GBI investigation to finish before bringing those charges? Were you aware of that? Yes, I was. Okay. As an attorney, and again, looking at this with the, the environment we have right now with police officers constantly under attack from, from this committee and from others and all over the country, and especially from the Speaker of the House, as an attorney and especially a prosecutor, do you think it's appropriate to charge a law enforcement officer with a crime as severe as felony murder without giving the investigation more than a mere days and without obtaining a, an indictment from the grand jury? And while you announce the charges, lay out a case that is full of falsehoods. I've said that I, I would have preferred and, uh, that he had used the grand jury and had waited till the Georgia Bureau had completed its investigation. Well, I appreciate your help in that, and with that, I yield back. Thank you. With that, the chair recognizes uh, Ms. Mr. Johnson from Georgia. Thank you, uh, General Boy. Your opening statement reads like it was written by Alex Jones or Roger Stone. Do you oh. stand by that statement? Yes. Now, I'm sure that we can agree on some things we disagree on a whole lot, but I'm sure we can agree on the fact that President Trump is just a prolific tweeter. Isn't that correct? He seems to be. And he tweeted many times about the Roger Stone sentencing, didn't he? I don't know how many times he tweeted about it. Well, many times, you, and you are aware of them because you said it would, it hurts you from doing your job. And isn't it true that when prosecutors in the Roger Stone case filed a memo with the court recommending a sentence of seven to nine years in prison. A few hours later, President Trump tweeted that the sentence recommendation was, quote, a disgrace. You're aware of that? Yes. And General Barr, several hours after that, you filed a pleading with the court 
stating that the sentence recommendation would be changed and that you would be asking for a lighter sentence for Roger Stone. Isn't that correct? No, no what is correct is that well, er, er, what is correct that on February 10th, Monday, no, no, I gave instructions no, 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 as to what the... my time. Yeah, I'm answering your question. So you got to let him answer. Reclaiming my time, you filed a sentencing recommendation hours after President Trump tweeted his dissatisfaction with the Stone recommendation, and you changed that recommendation. No, I directed the night before. Trump, the night before. That is well, Monday I, night. I know your story, but I'm asking. Well, I'm telling my story. That's well, what I'm here to do. To tell you well, I do. That's why I'm here. My question. Well, I'm here to tell my story. Well, and on the night you before, hear my the night before on February 10th, well, sir, on February I, 10th, I directed. Reclaiming my time, sir. Reclaiming my time. And I know you don't want to answer, but the facts are clear. Sentencing recommendation made in the morning, tweet. In the afternoon, you changed the sentencing recommendation that... No, the tweet, tweet was not made in the afternoon. The tweet was made at, I think, 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Well, the tweet was made before and after. Tweet tweeted about that relentlessly, and you've agreed to that. Now, when you filed your sentencing recommendation asking for a lower sentence... I didn't ask for a lower sentence. Well, you said that you were going to recommend a lower sentence... And you no, I let, what, we, wasn't the sentence that was recommended by the line prosecutors according to the sentencing guideline calculations? It was within it was within the guidelines, but it was not within Justice so, Department policy in now, my view. General Barr, you're expecting the American people to believe that you did not do what Trump wanted you to do when you changed that sentencing recommendation and lowered it for Roger Stone. You think the American people don't understand that you were carrying out Trump's? I was not. I, I had not discussed my sentencing recommendation with anyone at the White you House or anyone, president, exactly. or anyone outside you know the, the president department. What wanted you to do, and that's what you did. No, uh, Attorney I, did, so did, did, let, let, let me ask you: Do you think it's fair? Do you think it is fair for a 67-year-old man? to be sent time. to prison for seven to nine years? It was in accordance with the sentencing. No, it was not. You just said that it was, and your lying prosecutors I, will testify that it was also. Now, I'm going to move on from that. The department During your would, time as attorney it is not the Depart or Herbert Walker or Bush, you never changed the sentencing recommendation for a friend of uh, Herbert Walker Bush, did you? No, I, as I recall. All right. I, uh, that's all I'm not, asking. No. And over the course of your time as Trump... Was, nothing was never elevated to me. Over the course of your tenure with Trump, you've changed two sentencing recommendations. Not one, but two. Which Correct? Were, which were they? Yeah, Michael Flynn. I didn't change it. Well, you said... Well, you indicated that... Um, you, yeah, you changed it because the original Flynn sentencing recommendation was for Flynn to serve zero to six months. But under your authority, the Justice Department supplemented that recommendation with a pleading that stated the Department of Justice's agreement with Flynn's lawyers that probation would be a reasonable sentence and that the DOJ would not be seeking prison time for Michael Flynn. Isn't that correct? I don't think that's what it said. Well, that's what it said, sir. You go back and read it. I, I, think, prior, both, I think both pleadings sir, said that. Reclaiming my time, prior to you the becoming The gentleman's time chair. has expired. Madam Chair, you, you, can, you can give a speech or you can ask questions. If you do the latter, you need to let the witness answer the questions. And that's the chair's obligation, and chair's responsibility to allow that to happen. Mr. Buck is recognized for five minutes. Good grief. Appearing Talking about the Railroad the committee today. General Barr, there is a disturbing pattern we have seen throughout history with totalitarian systems of government. The leaders first seek to disarm the population, then they encourage goon squads to suppress opposing voices. And finally, once they have disarmed and silenced the opposition, these authoritarian leaders institute policies that root out and crush freedom in every form. Unfortunately, the American left has been infected with the same totalitarian desire to remove firearms and silence opposing views as part of a campaign to achieve its political ends. 
We've seen this scenario play out in every major Democrat-run city in America. Progressive leaders push to disarm law-abiding Americans to further their influence while watching as crime rates soar. We even saw a failed presidential and Senate candidate Beto O'Rourke proudly tell Americans, hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15 and your AR or your AK-47. Now the American left is actively cheering as its fascist militia Antifa rages in the streets. Antifa is a domestic terrorist organization that hijacks peaceful rallies, organizes armed riots, attacks peaceful protesters, burns buildings, loots stores, and spreads hate. Reports of Antifa-linked attacks began circulating in 2017. These thugs, often armed with sticks and pepper spray and other, uh, other instruments, showed up to silence college Republican groups at Berkeley. The left was silent. Then in June 2019, Antifa jumped into the national conversation after journalist Andy No was brutally attacked in Portland. No arrests were made. The left again was silent. Almost exactly one year ago today, the Wall Street Journal ran an op-ed stating Portland has to do something to deter political violence or the city will get more of it. Of course, the city's feckless leadership has only further encouraged Antifa's violent annex. As a result, we've seen 61 straight nights of violence in Portland. Antifa's fascist totalitarian activities are now oozing into other Democrat-run cities. Last Sunday, Antifa launched a violent assault on a peaceful pro-police demonstration in Denver, Colorado. Conservative leaders in Colorado, including Randy Corcoran, a Denver area lawyer and radio talk show host, organized a family-friendly event in honor of Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. The atmosphere was peaceful, and a counter-protesters were given plenty of space to advocate their message. But as the afternoon wore on, a swarm of violent Antifa thugs infiltrated the peaceful Black Lives Matter counter-protesters and began assaulting pro-police Americans. These are 20 and 30-year-old thugs assaulting 50, 60, 70, and even 80-year-old Americans who only wanted to show their support for law enforcement. What's worse, Denver's cowardly liberal leadership ordered police to retreat once they saw members of Antifa entering the fray. A Denver police detective, Nick Rogers, apologized for this terrible decision. Detective Rogers summed it up best in a recent radio interview, quote, I'm sorry on behalf of the rank and file. That's not us. That's not who we are. It just kills me that we let good people down. He continued, I found out that a retreat order was given by the incident commander, and we had one lieutenant step up and say, we aren't leaving. This lieutenant said, these people are going to get killed if we don't stay. So he kept his people there. That's the reason this thing didn't get worse, end of quote. These are sad times in America. Free speech and the right to keep and bear arms are both being threatened by violent anarchists. And the best our chairman can do is call Antifa a myth. General Barr, this has to stop. We can't let Antifa continue terrorizing our country. Can you please tell us about the appropriate use of civil and criminal RICO statutes to address violent criminal groups like Antifa? In the, uh, in the wake of the, the beginning of these riots, uh, I asked our joint terrorism task forces, the FBI's joint terrorism task forces around the country, uh, to uh, be our principal means of developing evidence and prosecuting uh, violent extremist terrorists who are involved in these activities. And one of the tools, obviously, we would use is RICO, which can be used against an organization. But that doesn't mean that we currently have a RICO case uh, pending. Okay. I, I thank the uh, gentleman. And, and uh, do you have anything you want to say in response to the speeches that have been given by the other side and, and then you've been cut off? Yeah, well, what's on Lafayette, on Lafayette? The gentleman's time has expired. Okay. Can I ask for a brief recess? Yeah, Madam Chair, the witness like a break. Yes. Mr. Barr, Mr. Barr, 10 minutes. for a brief. 10 minutes? Five. Okay. Recess for five minutes. We're, the committee will stand in recess for five minutes. Good day, I'm Andrea Mitchell in Washington. You have been watching a contentious hearing. Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee.
Boy, it's more than contentious. I just imagine Mr. Barr, he realized that he's being railroaded here. He's wanting to get to the bottom of this towards what is going on in response to this type of atmosphere. In other words, he may clam up. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have a right for an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one shall be appointed for you. This is all nip and tuck. It's, it's uh, coming off the cuff and people just don't understand the seriousness of this atmosphere towards where this is all heading. But I think this gentleman does that asked for a five minute recess. Extraordinary on so many levels, but a lot of criticism of the democratic questioning being... It's bizarre. Not focused and not uh, well organized, frankly. Well, I think we need to establish a couple of things. These hearings tend to generate more heat than light as they typically are. This is not how you get into sort of in-depth oversight. This is how in a five minute increment you get maybe one or two questions answered or an opportunity to make your point. And no committee in either House of Congress, no matter who is in charge of it at any given time, this is not a partisan statement, uh, is more political than the Judiciary Committee. It's just the way that Congress works. So you do see uh, more of an emphasis being placed sometimes on making points than on eliciting information. To that end, we have seen, I think a focus on the Democratic side has been somewhat scattered, going across a number of different issues. On the Republican side, uh, the focus is pretty clear here. It's uh, showing uh, what, <laughs> in the way they paint it, as though Antifa is out burning down every American city, and that that is probably the largest single threat to American democracy right now. They are uh, at least sort of somewhat united around an image they are trying to pretend, uh, present here of American cities under attack, and Bill Barr and the Justice Department defending them. We'll see if in this short break perhaps things get a little bit more organized and we see more of an effort to follow up on any of these individual threads that are being pulled uh, from time to time by Democratic lawmakers. Pete Williams, who covers the Justice Department, of course, uh, a lot of partisanship at, at uh, congressional hearings, but this is one of the most political that I've seen on both sides. Absolutely. Well, I don't know, Andrea. I mean, they always tend to be a little bit this way. Uh, I think this is my eighth or ninth. Well, I think uh, I would just say that that video. <laughs> let me just say, let me just say, Pete, that presenting for Jim Jordan, the ranking Republican, to present that video when the committee rules are that there should be 48 hours of warning, and the selective editing of that video with correspondence, uh, former Vice President Biden, President Obama, Susan Rice, and others, all talking about peaceful protest out of context, and then showing the most violent viral video that anyone has seen all in one seven minute 44 second spurt was pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I think the, the Republicans, of course, are focusing a lot on the Mueller investigation as we expected them to. The Democrats are, are, are focusing in on sort of what we expected them to. I, I think the point that where there's the largest disagreement that I've seen is on the federal presence in Portland. Uh, what the Democrats are saying is, this is the president's wanting to use a deployment of force uh, to build an election case uh, that uh, that Democrats are not protecting uh, cities and you need Republicans to maintain order. What Barr is saying is that the federal force was sent there to defend and protect the courthouse and that there's a nightly, it's not the peaceful protest that they're concerned about, it's the nightly violent attacks on the courthouse and on federal agents. And he said for the first time here today that uh, three uh, agents were uh, injured over the weekend and may have been uh, blinded by the use of lasers. So I think that's where the largest um, focus has been. And I think, Andrew, it's been frustrating for everybody that uh, they haven't allowed uh, a better exchange on the use of force at Lafayette Square because there's a lot of unanswered questions about that. And it's, uh, I think that's where the frustration that the, the questions haven't had much of a give and take. You really haven't learned anything there. Well, we're going to go back to the hearing. The Attorney General back in the chair. Democrats are picking up the question. The conviction came in under the former U.S. Attorney and 
uh, and the time that Timothy Shea started? I, I think Shea may have had conversations with people in the Did you ever have so. conversations with a former U.S. attorney about this case? About the sentencing? Stone. I, I, I don't recall any discussion about Stone. With, right. With so, Timothy Shea, you said in the interview that he was new, he had just started. Um, he, he was new, but he worked for you for a long time, didn't he? Yes. And what was his job for you? Well, when I was Attorney General 30 years ago, he worked. No, 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 now, right. just, just now. He was, he was on my staff. He advised you on, on criminal justice policy and law enforcement, right? Correct. And you, act, you named him acting U.S. attorney. Uh, had you discussed the Stone case with him before you named him acting U.S. attorney? No. Did you discuss sentencing with him? Not before. The first time was when he came in. It wasn't Monday, actually, to, just to refresh your recollection. In a prior interview, you said he came in the week before. He came in to see some senior staff. That's what I said, no, that's what I said. He may have he may have had discussions right. with people in the deputy's office. I was not involved in those discussions. Basically, I didn't, uh, as far as I can apply, no substantive involvement in Stone until that Monday when he came in in the morning. Well, the I'm sorry, Mr. Attorney General. The week before when he came in to see the the senior staff that I, he had worked with the week before when he was working. On no, I said staff. I said I think he had raised it with people in the deputy's office. That's senior staff too. Right. I understand. So, he, but I was not involved. He started on he started on July 31st. The first week he was there, he came to raise this issue. I think he started February 1st. Right. The first week he was there, he came into your office to raise the issue of sentencing. Um, in the interview you did with ABC, you said no, you. No, I, I don't think he. he that's what you that's what you told ABC News. You said that he's talked to senior staff. Not you perhaps, but he talked to senior staff. That I, I, I don't, I don't know what you, you know, I, I think I speak English. I said that before he came in to see me, I believe he had some conversation. Conversation with, with senior staff. staff. Right. That's right. Before he okay. came to see you. We're saying the same thing. But, I but, just the, asked, but the first it was raised with me was on Monday. Was on Monday. Did you talk to the senior staff after they spoke with him? I think at a nine o'clock meeting, uh, they said that uh, he was trying to work something out on sentencing, and, and he was actually optimistic that something could be worked out. So I didn't really think of it as an issue until that Monday, when he told me that right. So then prosecutors. He, and, so then he filed. So then they filed. He filed the sentencing uh, memo, and the sentencing memo called for seven to nine years. It's the policy of the U.S. Attorney's Office to suggest a specific guideline range, which um, which they did. And then you overruled the line prosecutors. They asked for a lower sentence, um, and you gave some reasons. You talked about health. Health is to be considered only for an extraordinary physical impairment. Did that apply to Roger Stone, Mr. Uh, Attorney General? Actually, That's what the guidelines said. That's well, actually, I, I, I can't. You know, I can't reveal all the information. I just, you, I'm not asking what his health was, but did that apply? No. Okay. Uh, and did it? What, and sorry, did it what apply? Is health. Was that health, a reason? Health is a reason. To I know. Is that the case? Is that the reason for Roger Stone? That where you're asking for a lower sentence. Let me go on. It says I age. Let me go on. Let me go on. Age, why I hold on one second. Age can be consideration. It says only if it creates conditions that are of an unusual degree and distinguish the case from typical cases. He was 67. Does the that judge apply agreed to with me, Congressman. No, that's not the what judge I'm, I'm not me. asking you that. The, the judge Supreme. agreed I'm with me. I'm not asking whether. I know you're not. I'm not asking, asking you that. Saying. And the issue here is the issue here is whether Roger Stone was treated differently because he was friends with the president. When you asked that, when you asked to reduce the sentence. You said enhancements were technically applicable. Mr. Attorney General, can you think of any other cases where the defendant threatened to kill a witness, threatened to threaten a judge, lied to a judge, where the Department of Justice claimed that those were mere technicalities? Can you think of even one? The judge agreed with our Can you think of even one? I'm not asking about the judge. I'm asking about what you did to reduce the sentence of of Roger Stone. Uh, yes. Can you think, Mr. Are, Attorney General, he threatened the life of a witness. And the witness and said he didn't feel threatened. And you view that as a technicality, Mr. Attorney General. The, 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 as, the witness, is there another time can I answer that question? Happened? Can I have just a few seconds to answer sure, the question? Sure, I'm asking if okay. there's another time in, this in all case, time the, of the Justice the Department. Judge, the judge agreed with that. You want to answer my question, the Mr. Judge Attorney agreed General, and it's unfortunate. And it, the appearance is that, as you said earlier, this is exactly what you want. The essence of rule of law is that we have one rule for everybody. And we right. don't in this case because he's a friend of the president. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Uh, Ms. Roby. Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm a member of both this committee as well as the Appropriations Committee, and I've been able to see firsthand 
um, both the funding and the operation of the department. Um, additionally, before I was elected to Congress, I served on the city council in my hometown of Montgomery, Alabama. And I've witnessed the importance and the value of various Justice Department grant programs in the resources to state and local governments. For example, the Alabama Fusion Center, uh, which is designed to combine information between federal, state, and local government, private sector entities, and the intelligence community um, has been a recipient of these federal grants. And the Alabama Fusion Center is also responsible for the Alabama Center for Missing and Exploited uh, Children and has done a great job um, in work in combating um, child exploitation. Do you believe that Congress is adequately funding programs that provide state and local agencies with the tools that they need uh, to be effective in preventing and pursuing crimes such as child exploitation and human trafficking, um, particularly over the internet? I think we could always use more resources for that, Congressman. But, but if I could just have a moment of your time to respond to these questions sure. here on, uh, that were being asked about this, the uh, Roger Stone sentencing. The uh, U.S. attorney came to me and said that the four line prosecutors were threatening to resign unless they could recommend seven to nine years. Uh, but there was no comparable case to support that. It would have been a very disparate sentence. All the cases were clustered around three years sentence for that. And the way they had gotten to the seven to nine was by applying an enhancement. And there, and there are debates all the time within the Department of Justice about the proper calculations under the guidelines and whether a particular enhancement applies or doesn't apply. And those are usually uh, worked out and resolved. But here they were saying that they were taking an enhancement that has traditionally been applied to mafioso and things like that, threatening a witness, and they were applying it to him because he had a phone call at night where he told a witness that if you want to get it on, let's get it on, and, and I'll take your dog. And uh, we felt that that technically could apply, but in this case, it really didn't reflect the underlying conduct. And the overarching requirement at the Department of Justice is that we do not presume and automatically apply the guidelines. We make individual assessments of the defendant and what is really just under the case and nothing that is excessive and uh, these individuals were trying to force the U.S. attorney uh, who was new in the office to adopt seven to nine and I made the decision no uh, we are going to uh, leave it up to the judge and that later, when that was not done, that evening, I told people we had to go back and correct that the next morning. So that, that's the sequence of events. But at the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is in the, uh, in the eating. The judge said she would not have gone along, she didn't think, with the first recommendation because the enhancement artificially inflated the exposure of the defendant. And she came out exactly where I had come out. So at the end of the day, the question is fairness to the individual. And uh, even though I was going to uh, get a lot of criticism I, at the end of the, uh, for, for doing that, uh, I think at the end of the day, my obligation is to be fair to the individual. Thank you for permitting me. Yeah, I'm to happy to, to have yielded you uh, time to respond. Uh, that being said, um, Mr. Attorney General, um, as I am a departing member of Congress and have just a few short moments left, I just want to express to you uh, in the department how important this issue that I originally asked you about is to me, both as a member of Congress representing my constituents in Alabama, but also as a mother of two beautiful children. And I am increasingly alarmed um, about the way that children are just one click away from um, being on a website, a forum, or a chat room, or a social media site while where bad actors uh, may be lurking. And whereas I only have a few short seconds left, I would just ask you in the time that I have left in Congress that we could continue to work together um, to combat um, child exploitation and uh, human trafficking, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing on this. Absolutely. 
Congresswoman, and, and as you know, one of the most difficult issues coming up is uh, encryption, because as this material gets encrypted in the chat rooms and the areas where they groom these young children, uh, once it becomes encrypted, it'll be very hard for us to uh, police it. Right. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Ms. Bass. Uh, Attorney General Barr, when it comes to police engagement, last August when speaking to the National Fraternal Order of Police, you shared your views on police engagement with the public. You stated, and I quote, underscore the need to comply first, and if warranted, complain later. This will make everyone safe, the police, subject, the police sub suspects and the community at large, and those who resist must be prosecuted. I repeat, zero tolerance for resisting police. This will save lives. Do you stand by that statement? Yes, I think it's very important. A, a zero tolerance attitude is costing lives, not saving them, especially in communities. of Well, I'm not, I'm not saying uh, that. I reclaim my time. A movement and protests have arisen in response to police brutality. Here are a few examples of who bears the cost of zero tolerance. Elijah McClain was walking home from a convenience store when he was approached by police. He had not committed a crime. Police held him in a chokehold for 15 minutes, then injected him with cat catamine. Ketamine, not under a doctor's supervision, but at the direction of non-medically trained and unlicensed police officers. Are you familiar with that case? No. Do you know how frequently ketamine is used by law enforcement to subdue civilians, especially people of color? No. Did you know if police departments have been documented as directing paramedics and EMTs to eject ketamine during arrest? No. Um, have you, well then, I guess you haven't evaluated the use of force tactics by beca since becoming AG and especially this particular tactic of subdu subduing suspects with ketamine. Not with respect to ketamine, no. Will you commit to directing the department to evaluate the protocols around the use of ketamine, chokeholds, and other methods used by federal law enforcement officials when making arrests or detaining subjects? Well, absolutely. Under the president's executive order, we are reviewing uh, Thank you. And especially, use of force and working good. with police departments. As, especially the ketamine. That's pretty the, outrageous. Yeah. George Floyd was killed by a police officer via a chokehold. For eight minutes and 46 seconds, a police officer knelt on his neck as he, as he begged for his life. He was suspected of using a counterfeit $20 bill. That's how zero tolerance can amount to a death sentence for black men when used in communities of color. With George Floyd screaming, as we all know, he couldn't breathe. Now consider James Holmes, who murdered 12 people and injured 70 others in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, the same town as Elijah McLean, where he was arrested. James wore body armor, had a knife, semi-automatic weapons, and an AR-15. Yet he was calmly arrested by the same police department as Elijah McLean without a chokehold or an injection of ketamine. Dylan Roof used a gun to murder nine people and injured another at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in South Carolina. When he was arrested, no chokeholds, no injections, he was treated so well that officers brought Dylan Roof Burger King after arresting him. Are you familiar with that case? Yes. I raise those two examples to follow up on what my colleague from Texas highlighted earlier, that the department is not doing enough to address issues of racism, bias, and brutality in law enforcement. When someone who commits mass murder is calmly arrested and served Burger King, while a young man walking down the street is placed in a chokehold and injected with ketamine, then dies. Uh, you said that uh, under the executive order, the administration is looking at chokeholds. What have you uh, determined so far? Well, we're, we're uh, setting up a system uh, of certification of police departments. And part of what our charter is, is to come up with um, criteria that will be used for certification, including limitations on use of force, specifically including cho chokeholds. So in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, part of it called for a national registry of law enforcement officers as a resource for police chiefs to determine who are the best candidates for jobs. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, Tamir Rice might be alive today if, police, if the police chief who hired him had known that that police officer had been fired uh, from another department. What is your view of a national registry of law enforcement officers? 
Uh, the, the second aspect of the president's executive order is to set up a database like that so that all uh, determinations of excessive force around the country go into that database. And if police departments aren't reporting that information, they wouldn't be certified. So we do believe in one national point where you can go in and get uh, determinations of excessive force on uh, law enforcement candidates for jobs. Good, thank you. And, and I do want to uh, comment on part of your opening statement when you were saying that after the Jim Crow period that our justice system was equal. And um, I don't believe that, that that's I said the, the law. Case. I said the laws were made equal. The laws are made equal. They are certainly not applied equally. Uh, we do have systemic problems in our law enforcement system, our criminal justice system on every level. The fact of the matter is 2.3 million people in the United States are incarcerated. We incarcerate 24% of the world's prisoners. 34% are black while African-Americans are just 13% of the, of the U.S. population. So just, I want to stop right there and back up. Justice. Let's get these statistics again. Uh, law enforcement candidates for jobs. Good, thank you. And, and I do want to uh, comment on part of your opening statement when you were saying that after the Jim Crow period that our justice system was equal. And um, I don't believe that, that that's I said the, the law, case. I said the laws were made equal. The laws are made equal. They are certainly not applied equally. Uh, we do have systemic problems in our law enforcement system, our criminal justice system on every level. In our law enforcement system, our criminal justice system on every level, in our uh, we do have systemic problems in our law enforcement system, our criminal justice system on every level. The fact of the matter is 2.3 million people in the United States are incarcerated. We incarcerate 24% of the world's prisoners. 34% are black, while African Americans are just 13% of the, of the U.S. population. So justice is still not equal, nor are our laws. And I think when we look at how many people are incarcerated or how many people are killed, it is not the numbers. It is the percentage to the percentage of that group in the U.S. population. I yield back the time. Generally, generally yields back, uh, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, you've described the prosecution of Roger Stone as righteous. That's clearly something that the president and I disagree with you on. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps the prosecution of Andrew McCabe, who lied four times, thrice under the penalty of perjury, would be more righteous. I would suggest to you that uncovering the criminal conspiracy that existed where people in our own government were trying to convince intelligence agents and operatives around the world to destabilize our elections and to discredit our president would perhaps be more righteous. But as we sit here today, I don't think that Mr. Stone or Mr. McCabe or any of those other folks are killing anyone or burning down our buildings. And so I'd like to focus our effort on the most acute need I believe our country has. You've recently said that you believe Antifa to be a terrorist organization. What's your basis for that belief? I, I, I'm not sure I said terrorist organization. I said we're investigating it as domestic terrorism. but. Uh, Antifa, there are a number of uh, violent extreme groups in the United States, and they're across the spectrum. Uh, Antifa is heavily represented in the recent riots. That's not to say they're the only group involved. Uh, and uh, they have been identified as involved in a number of the, of the violent mob actions that have taken place around the country. And Mr. Attorney General, I, I saw the chairman of the Judiciary Committee recently say that Antifa is a myth, that their involvement in this violence uh, isn't something that, that is real. What's your reaction to the chairman? I don't think it's a myth. Uh, Antifa is, 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 um, uh, can be best thought of, I think, as an as a, uh, umbrella term for what is essentially a movement comprised of uh, loosely organized groups around the country. In some of these, in some areas of the country, there are... Antica isn't a myth. The skinheads pertaining to the Aryan Brothers isn't a myth. The Cody's, wild Cody's that come out of Mexico, those groups isn't a myth. Um... 
hell's angels is not a myth. The disciples is not a myth. The Wiccans is not a myth. All these other different organizations are not myths. Okay? And I guess they must have me marked down as me being a violent organization pertaining to the Windmill Ministries because I have offered to either sacrifice myself towards being sacrificed or towards killing a darkly complected individual Arabic descent that is now walking around in a fleshly body pertaining to the existence of Satan, the spiritual Lucifer, that I've been preaching now for over 30 plus years. They must, obviously, they must have me pegged as me being some sort of violent group. And the thing about it, I was always under the impression that America has always stood up against this type of aggression. Even whenever we went to war during Desert Storm and Desert Shield, that was our primary objective was to rid the axes of evil over in the Middle East and to bring stability to that region. These are open records that has been discussed publicly in the public domain again and again and again. Which leads me to the last and final thing that I want to say. Why would had a federal judge in Paducah, Kentucky leaned up against the charge towards premeditated murder, which was a Class E felony, if I did not agree to go get a psychiatric evaluation done in 2010 going up to MCC in downtown Chicago. If these government officials have not turned the tables in protecting evil versus going up against evil, how come the founder of the Windmill Ministries was ever called on the carpet to begin with in going and being institutionalized long enough to be psychoanalyzed during the presence of a six-month stay pertaining to the charges up in Paducah, Kentucky. That was the result of what went on in Land Between the Lakes. Placed on a two-year probation period, told not to contact the LBL personnel, either by letter or electronically or by smokestacks. Do not touch, interfere, do not make contact with any law enforcement agency in Land Between the Lakes for a two-year period of time. I honored that. Right down to the T. To the point that there was times I needed to drive through Kentucky for various reasons and chose not to. Because I was under this federal mandated probation law. After making this agreement with the, with the federal judge towards going and being studied, evaluated, and after being evaluated, the judge gave me an A plus in how that I had scored not only with Dr. Dana, but how that I had scored with various other levels of communications of how that I cooperated with law enforcement and I'd done this, I'd done that. In other words, I went through all the hula hoops and the cartwheels that they wanted me to do. The judge accommodated and, 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 and bragged about my performance. But yet no, but yet no, give or take about four months later, after making two telephone calls back to 
land between the lakes. One of them was to the office, and the other one was to a Mr. Gary Hawkins that both telephone calls was non-threatening and in an apologetic form they put out two federal warrants based around a federal park that gave the long arm of the law that much more of a long arm towards going all the way out to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma apprehending me dragging me back to Kentucky this time instead of me going in front of the federal administration our, our uh, administration administration this time I went in front of the state administration in front of a Judge Woodall there's where they ordered for another evaluation to be done being charged with stalking in the first degree over two telephone calls that according to their books covered the range of one to five years per call even though the calls was non-threatening and even though the calls was in apologetic form took up another nine and a half months of my life while going to another evaluation up in LaGrange, Kentucky, mandated, ordered by the judge, Judge Woodall, in Trigg County, and then released on my own reconnaissance. After me having to agree to a charge that I never should have had to, to, agree, to have agreed to, over stalking charges reduced to a misdemeanor and then once Tennessee picked up on that charge Tennessee was gonna stuff it down my you know what that much more even harder to the point that whenever my brother and I whenever my brother was still living was concerned about some children across the road of the conduct that the children was having to be exposed to, they twisted and turned it around to the point that they went after me again on a state federal charge that I had to agree to just to get out of jail after being incarcerated for 37 days and attempting to commit suicide. Because I know that I was being treated unfairly and unjustly. In addition to me losing $2,500, a three-bedroom house, a good job, and almost lost my uh, tools, a truck, a trailer, and all my records. They brought this illness upon to me that I currently have of obesity that has now elevated into type 2 diabetes. But yet now, whenever I put my story out before the people, I get no positive feedback. I get no positive feedback from the judges. I get no positive feedback from law enforcement agencies. I get no positive feedback from none of these people that have sworn to do their duties in a just way. I get no positive feedback from none of the churches. All I get is ridicution and being demonized and dehumanized for standing up for I thought the right thing. That was the whole primary purpose for me being anointed by God and going up to LBL and spending almost a year up there fasting and praying and living like Jeremiah Johnson up in the woods. Praying for God to, to bring an anointing up onto this ministry so that we would see a great revival that would eventually evolve and elevate into a revolution. It's obvious that this country has been hijacked. It has been hijacked by evil demonic people that claim one thing, but in reality are something totally different. A reflection up onto the Indian Native American 
that accused the white man of having a forked tongue. For he speaketh one way, but doeth something totally different. You would think by now, after 30 plus years, after a man being 59 years old, that has spent over half of his life dedicated to this, to this ideal, to this ministry, to this dream, this, this anointing, you would think by now that there would be some sort of movement in breaking this resistance that began back in 1988 whenever there was nine tapes sent to the White House that developed into the existence of the falling of the Berlin Wall during Ronald Reagan's administration. You would think by now they would have already come clean that they would have realized their sins and that they would embark upon some sort of a restitution. But rather than them doing that, they are still embarking upon to this Mexican standoff that is just causing that much more hardship and that much more fatalities to fall upon the innocent lives right here in the United States. And if it isn't coming in one form, it's coming in another. Just as recently as a while ago, I wrote a letter expressing this to a judge here in Weekly County by the name of Tommy Moore that still has yet to face me on all these accusations and charges that I am bringing forth to the American people. The main charge in my situation pertaining to Mr. Tommy Moore is dereliction of duty because if Tommy Moore would have done the right thing during the events that I was not even here at the time in 2010 whenever my brother was taken down by a bunch of hoods, by a bunch of uh, savages by a bunch of animals right here in this area I wouldn't have had to have come back to this type of resistance movement that wasn't just coming from one family wasn't just coming from two families but was coming from several families right here in this neighborhood once more these are the people that didn't want to support the ministry that supported peace they wanted hardship to fall upon the humanity including the judges, including the prosecuting attorneys, including the attorneys, including those who are associated with the churches and law enforcement agencies within a 200 mile radius around here. In addition to those who have marked me either in Atlanta, Georgia, or Oklahoma City, or in Kentucky, or Washington, D.C. So now that the genie is coming fully out of the bottle pertaining to seeing all this riffraff that now the American people is having to deal with, now the finger pointing comes out. Well, it's your fault. Well, you said this. Well, you've done this. Well, you meant this. Well, you meant that. It all falls back to what didn't happen that should have happened in 1988. A bunch of clowns that thought that they was going to be able to overcome God and the saints of God pertaining to the anointing of the biblical Bible prophecy that is to occur here upon to the land. And it will occur in one way or the other. I promise it will occur. It has been delayed. There's no doubt the message has been delayed. It's went through examination after examination after examinations. There's been difficulty at times towards getting my message out because I was so vulnerable because I was basically a one-man horse and pony show. But see, that's what they wanted. They wanted me to be stopped. They wanted this message to be halted. They wanted 
their divorce rate to climb. They wanted their incarceration to climb. They wanted all this freelance sex sickness to engulf upon the society as far as homosexuality and lesbianism and now transvestites and the LKQ communities. They wanted us to be trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. They wanted these things to occur. That way it would basically abolish any fair-minded do justice pertaining to righteousness upon to not only this land but upon to the land all over this planet. That's what they wanted. These demons that was raised up during the hippie era, during the Woodstock area, that pursued in acid and, and all these other types of freelance drugs thought that they could overcome and conquer God and God's people. And all they've done is brought that much more illness and, and pain and horror to not only their own lives but to the lives of the innocent. You see, my friends, this ministry didn't fail the people after a 30-year-plus span. It was the people that failed the ministry because the people didn't embark towards supporting the ministry. And because they didn't support the ministry, they wanted the ministry to fail. They wanted the ministry to be doomed, but they didn't realize as they was dooming the ministry, they was dooming their very own lives. They was dooming their children. They was dooming their grandchildren. They was dooming their children's children's future for a better tomorrow. A very sick, perverted society. A cancer none unlike any other cancer that has ever been spread upon to the American land other than during the time that the Europeans tried so desperately to eradicate the Native American people. Once more, white man speaketh with fork and tongue. White man is the one that corrupted and contaminated this great nation to the point that now it's reeking, reeking horror on every level imaginable. And we get a state representative that wants to get up there and pick and poke and ridicule William P. Barr, an honorable man in doing his job. I have never seen anything so sickening in my entire life that began once more with the Reagans and the Bushes of greed and selfishness. Sickening to the point that now the wicked is turning upon to the wicked just as the Bible talks about because God has given them over to a reprobate lie, to a reprobate lie, to allow for them to believe a lie and to be damned. See, they think that because they have nice cars, nice bank accounts, nice homes, nice uh, boats, nice this, nice that, they think that they have it made. And they do in the world of Satan's world. So far they got it made. But these are going to be the very people that God will say, Depart from me. Depart from me. Depart from me. For I have never known thee. Depart from me. Because these are the very people that has brought the grief, the horror, the horror and the destruction 
up onto not only America, but up onto the rest of the countries on this planet. They will be accountable, beginning with the crosses, the kneels, the curries, Don Curry, other people that was involved in this resistance movement going all the way back to 1983 in Kenton, Tennessee. They will be held accountable, including the Sandersons and everybody else that's still living there today. And if they won't be accountable in this lifetime, you can bet your bottom dollar they'll be accountable in the lifetime to come. Because not one of them have come to me and offered any type of confirmation. Not a one. Not a one. Oh, Tommy Moore, he's he's wishwashed around like most politicians. And he's brought up stuff like, well, Dennis, I've never said that I was perfect. Well, Dennis, I'm liable to make mistakes too. Not ever admitting that he's ever made a mistake, but he always implies that to kind of comfort the blow a little bit. Like he's trying to be honest, but he's not being all the way honest. It was Tommy Moore that didn't do his job effectively and efficiently, not only whenever I wasn't living on this property, but whenever I come back to this property because my brother David and I spent good earned money and, and done the right things towards contacting the Sheriff's Department again and again and again and again. Every time there was some sort of an incident that occurred out here, we would always go promptly and professionally before the services of the people which is go to the law, go to the law, call the law, contact the sheriff's department. That's what we would do. And it would get thrown off, ignored, set back, not taken care of properly. And now you wonder how come this country is falling apart at the seams? As far as I'm concerned, that courthouse in Weekly County and different other law enforcement agencies around here close blood reeks from the walls that is now going down pertaining to the souls that have wound up innocently gone to hell because of this type of resistance movement that has taken apart in not only my life, but in everybody's life, coming near a neighborhood near you. And these people sit back and snigger and laugh and are entertained by this. These people are more wickeder than the people that God destroyed during the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. They cover up their inadequacies by going to church on Sunday morning. Or they'll do this, or they'll give to this charity, or give to that charity. But as far as them sacrificing what they've already got in their bank accounts, or their nice homes, or their cars, ha! forget it. You ain't going to get a dime out of them. But in the meantime, they sit back and they watch misery fester, horror fester city after city going through what they're going through that could have all been avoided if they would have just done the proper right thing. Which puts us right here, right now, presently, at this particular setting, which I guess it's, I don't know that it's an inquirer, I don't know if it's a hearing, I don't know if it's going to lead into a trial, but it kind of reminds me of what was going on pertaining to the impeachment uh, inquiries whenever they was bringing out all this stuff about what went on with the Ukrainians. It reminds me of that same type of setting. But now we're talking about homeland here. We're talking about people that works for we the people 
that obviously that some decisions have been made improperly that is now causing havoc, violence, blood to run the streets. And they wonder why. You got somebody right here called a messenger that's telling you why. Now you can be like the rest of these idiots and you can continue to keep disclaiming this and you can be in denial about this or you can keep continually saying, well, the gentleman that's talking, that's now in front of the camera, is psychologically, emotionally, chemically imbalanced. He's warped. He's lost his marbles. He don't have no sense. And he needs to be institutionalized. But if you got any sense at all towards what you see and what you understand, what you're hearing, what you're observing going on pertaining to all these protests and the coronavirus and us being $25 trillion, I think you better wake up if you care anything at all about what you say that you care about, which is the future of your own family, your children. You better wake up. Because if not, the boat's fixing to go down. Oh. And it's going to lunge. It ain't going down little by little. We're already seeing that. Yeah, she's already going down. She's already two-thirds down. But it's just like the Titanic. Once you get so much weight in the boat pertaining to buoyancy, boop, that's what's going to happen to us. And that's what a lot of people want to happen to us. And that's what I'm trying to prevent from not happening to us. And my message is continually being obscured, overlooked, excused, laughed at, demonized or dehumanized in some form of way. In the meantime, we sit and we listen to this stuff. Yeah, you can go to my you can go to my YouTube channel. And I've got episode after episode after episode after episode that I've been recording live off of this very, very box right here that they call a TV, which is part of the public domain. Everything that I've been doing, in generally speaking, 95% has been coming right there. Every now and then I do a little a little testimony thing towards where I'm at or what I'm doing or I'll record somebody or I'll be in a meeting or I'll do this but 95% 90 to 95 percent of everything that you can look up on my YouTube is in public domain come off of that right there recording after recording after recording and when you record these and put them out there it goes into satellite, and once it goes into satellite, any and everybody can listen and observe your material. It don't matter if it's China, it don't matter if it's Russia, it don't matter if it's Canada, it don't matter if it's South America. Once it leaves this planet, digitally speaking, and it gets put into a satellite, any Body that has the right equipment can tap in and you won't even know it. You won't see no type of feedback in how that they're drawing off of your material. You know why? Because they're going in the back door. They're not going in the front door. Now if you go in the front door, it's going to show you got this amount of hits. You got this amount of followers or, or supporters or subscribers. It'll show you what's going on in the front door. But what they don't tell you is that whenever you put stuff out there, if the right people are tracking you and examining you, they can go through the back door and you'll never, ever know how many people that you was actually affecting or touching with the material that you was putting out there. You know why? Because these people design the system. Do you not think that they know how to go in the back door 
and never be identified? Sure they do. And if they're doing it over here in America, they can do it in Russia. If they're doing it in Russia, they can do it in China. If they're doing it in China, they can do it in Australia. If they're doing it in Australia, they can do it in all these other countries. Cyber space wars are real. Whenever it comes to infiltrating people's policies and infiltrating various things that people don't want to be infiltrated are real. Number of groups and there are sort of centers of activity. Uh, the groups, uh, as I say, are loosely organized, but they are definitely organized. Uh, but as uh, since they have an, an anarchic temperament, they don't get along very well with each other. So I'm not suggesting it's a national organization that that, that moves nationally. Uh, they tend to to get organized for an event, and uh, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, organization right before an event occurs, but we see a lot of the organization during the, the mob violence. And, and that is a really important distinction when determining how to apply particularly our RICO laws to an organization like this. If Antifa is merely something that inspires people to go out and commit violence, that strikes me as legally distinct from Antifa being uh, an organizing influence to assist people in committing crimes. One question I get from my constituents is they watch the death and violence and disruption and chaos in Seattle and in Portland and in other places is whether or not there's a risk that that could metastasize to other areas of the country. Well, sure it can. And it is. It's just like a cancer. And once it starts developing, it starts mutating. Even more so now today because of the computer, because of cyberspace. More so now than ever. Once more, whenever these organizations form and they come together, ordinarily they don't last that long because it's basically violence against violence. It's it's uh, um, it's it's a brute brutality force, all for one and one for all. And that's the reason why they basically turn on themselves and start cutting each other's throat out of all this hostility and violence. Now, the way that the windmill, the way that the founder of the windmill has been judged, they have judged me off of the pretense of what the book of Revelations promotes in a physical fleshly form even though I wasn't the one that wrote the book of Revelations but I'm the one that's trying to abide by the book of Revelations and they don't realize it's not going to be the saints of God that's going to be committing these acts of violence as I projected or predicted in 2005 while living in Nashville, Tennessee, sending the 43rd President of the United States a t-shirt that read a bloody road ahead. Who do you think is going to be committing the blood? It's not going to be the saints of God, not if they're truly saints of God, because the saints of God has strict requirements under the teachings of Christ to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves. It's not going to be we, the saints, that's going to be committing the blood. It's the unbelievers. It's the wicked. It's the lukewarmers. It's the ones that are in sheep's clothing but promoting themselves as something different. And in reality, they're nothing more than raging tireless wolves. See, this whole thing has gotten twisted. The way that they have tried to imagery or weaponize me. And I have been put on pedestal after pedestal being used by one group or another regardless whether it was a legalized group or an illegal group in trying to manipulate or hijack its original purpose. 
and I have stead, steadily, steadfastly remained in the same concept, which is, which is, which is, before the opening of the second seal, which is Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, the red horse. You cannot take peace from the earth if there is no peace upon the earth to take. It will be the non-Christians killing the Christians during the opening of that second seal. This ministry has been violated again and again and again, beginning with Homeland Security in 1983 over in Kenton, Tennessee. Not counting what happened in 1989, not counting what happened in 1991, not counting towards what happened up in Kentucky, towards what happened in Atlanta, towards what happened in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and for darn sure, not counting what happened since I've come back here in 20 and 14. So let this fester. This is what various people thought that wasn't going to occur. Okay? The same thing with the Pharaohs. The Pharaohs thought, we got this thing whipped. We got the better God than, than Moses has. There's no way that Moses and Moses' God can bring destruction upon to us to the point that we're going to surrender or admit that Moses' God is greater than mine. Well, they was proven wrong. And so will this group of people that was in behind this resistance movement that began in 1983 over in a little town where my mother was raised up called Kenton, the white squirrel capital of the world. They will be proven wrong. Just like the Pharaohs was proven wrong. Just like the judges and the law enforcement agencies around here will be proven wrong of their resistance movement that has now put us all in peril, including themselves. Including themselves. They have cut off their own noses to despite their own faces. That's what I sat back and watched, heartbreakably. That's what I sat back and watched as innocent lives are being destroyed and mangled because of drug abuse, suicide abuse, suicides amongst our veterans, our, our senior citizens not being taken care of, our homeless not being taken care of, the drug addictions. I could go on and on and on with the problems here in America that these people are going to have to give an account for. And they don't think that they're going to give an account for these things. But they will give an account for these things because I have yet to see any type of confirmation. Either from the weekly county judicial system or the Kenton judicial system or the Kentucky judicial system or the... Oklahoma judicial system, I have yet to see any confirmation. They have not made an attempt to wrong, to right their wrongs. So we dig further into this. We get a little deeper into the mar. We go, well, what's the next, you know, it's just like peeling an, uh, 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 an onion. We, we, we strip back one layer. And then we go to another layer. And then we go to another layer. In the meantime, they hate me around here. They want me dead. They want my message dead. They want my anointing dead. <coughs> it's not that they don't believe me. They know that my life was spared. They know that I was anointed by God in bringing forth this message. It's just that they don't want to in here. They don't want to support it. They don't want to back it because they claim that they're Americans and they got the right not to do it. Not only do they got the right not to do it, but they got the right to come down here and mess with my life and mess with my brother's life and mess with the founder of this ministry's life and mess with God and God's life and the saints up onto this planet's life. They think that they have these rights. While we all suffer. 
like the Bible says, when it rains, it rains upon the just as well as the unjust. But when the wrath of God falls upon to this planet pertaining to judgment, judgment not only falls upon to the righteous, but it also falls upon to the unrighteous. It falls upon to the just, just like it falls upon to the unjust. And that's where we are. We are living in the days of judgment. Please listen to the rest of this because it is so sickening. I don't even want to take no more breaks from what's, what they're talking about because let them dig their own holes in the way that they need to dig them. And if they're not willing to go and find the people that has brought us to the point of where we are right now, true justice will never be true justice will never be manifested upon to this society here in America until they do. Have you given consideration to the risk that might befall other American communities if the Department of Justice were not to take action to protect and preserve federal property in places like Portland? Yes, absolutely. You know, we are concerned about this problem metastasizing around the country. And, and so uh, we feel that we have to, uh, in a place like Portland, where even where we don't have the support of the, uh, the state, co the local government, uh, we have to take a stand and defend this federal property. We can't uh, get to a level where we're, we're going to accept these kinds of violent attacks on federal courts. And if you did what my Democrat colleagues were asking, if you merely abandoned that federal property, allowed it to be overrun, allowed the people inside to be harmed, is it your view then that Antifa and other violent people engaged in these acts would simply stop, would simply accept that as their sole victory? Or is it your expert opinion, having dealt with a number of law enforcement and criminal cases in your legal career, that, that they wouldn't stop, that they would go to the next town, to the next community and potentially inspire more violence? There's no doubt in my mind that it would spread. And, and what comfort can you give Americans in my district and around? It would spread to the degree that once these people got their hands on the big equipment, on the bigger tools pertaining to not just handguns or long arm guns, but if they ever broke in towards getting tanks and airplanes, they could literally try to overtake this country in a coup. In a coup. And a coup does not just begin on the top end pertaining to assassinating their leader and taking over the White House, but a coup begins fundamentally within the grounds of that, of that country. And whenever you get enough of them, spreading just like that cancer, then is whenever you take a chance on a coup being formed. And if a coup is ever formed, then you're talking about civil war. You're talking about all out and out war. And that would be just exactly what our terrorist enemies over in the Middle East as well as these communist control countries would love to see they would love to see this great nation fall under its own hands that's where we are folks and if you can't understand that if you can't grasp that then obviously you're living on a different planet on the country that that you will stop this that you will stop the burning and destruction of federal property and that you will that you will give confidence to regular americans that they can go out in the streets without the risk of this terrorism well as you can see in, in portland we have uh, a relatively small number of, of federal officers who have been withstanding this for almost two months uh, it's a great strain but we, we cannot just stand aside and allow the federal court to be destroyed thank you for your service and for your great work i yield back gentlemen yields back mr richmond Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Attorney General Barr, you started your testimony with eloquent words about the life and legacy of John Lewis fighting systematic racism, uh, voter intimidation, civil rights. Uh, the one thing that you have in common with your two predecessors, both Attorney General Sessions and Attorney General Whitaker, is that when you all came here and brought your top staff, you brought no black people. That, sir, is systematic racism. 
That is exactly what John Lewis spent his life uh, fighting. And so I would just suggest uh, that actions speak louder than words. And you should really should keep the name of the Honorable John Lewis out of the Department of Justice's uh, mouth. Uh, let me also say, you mentioned bogus Russia gate. In your opinion, as the Attorney General of the United States of America, did Russia interfere or attempt to interfere in the 2016 election? Uh, yes. In your position as the Attorney General of the United States, is Russia attempting to interfere in the 2020 presidential election? Uh, I think I think we have to assume that they are. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, let's talk about the integrity of the election, which is also uh, something Congressman Lewis uh, fought for. Jared Kushner implied that the president could move the election date. Can a sitting U.S. president move an election date? Actually, I haven't looked into that question under the Constitution. Well, 2 U.S. Code Section 7 says federal election day is the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So if you take that as the correct statute, uh, is there any executive action by a president? I've never been asked the question before. I've never looked into it. As Attorney General of the United States, do you believe that this 2020 presidential election will be rigged? I have no reason to think it will be. Uh, president Trump tweeted uh, that the election will be rigged, but he also tweeted that when he was losing to Hillary Clinton, and he tweeted that the day after it was Fox showed that he was losing to Trump. But I don't want to be too political. Do you believe, as the Attorney General of the United States, that mail-in voting will lead to massive voter fraud? I think there's a high risk that it will. Do you ever vote, vote by mail-in ballot? Apparently I did once at least. But you believe that other people voting by mail could lead to massive fraud? No, what I've talked about, made very clear, is that I'm not talking about accommodations to people who have to be out of the state or have some particular need not to, uh, uh, inability to go and vote. What I'm talking about is the wholesale conversion of election to mail and voting. You, you do understand that African Americans disproportionately do not survive COVID-19 coronavirus. You are aware of that. All right, I didn't hear the question. You are aware that African Americans, black people disproportionately die from COVID-19 coronavirus, correct? I th yes, I think that's right. And not that it would be uh, the first time that African Americans would risk their lives to vote in this country to preserve its democracy. Uh, but the suggestion is that them having the ability to vote by mail would somehow uh, lead to massive voter fraud, but I won't stick to that. No, I, I didn't say uh, that. I just uh, state, I think, what is a reality, which is that if you have wholesale mail-in voting, it substantially increases the risk of fraud. But it doesn't make it likely. That's all I said. Now, I also saw on TV that the president said he's not sure that he'll accept the election results. Can a president just protest because he lost an election? protest in what sense? Well, can he contest an election just because he simply loses? Well, Gore versus B B you know, Bush v. Gore. Was well, I think that that was over uh, a slim voter margin. I'm talking about if it is very clear that the president has lost an election, uh, does he have a remedy to contest the election? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, let me go back to what uh, Representative Abbas mentioned. You mentioned the number that there were eight African-American killed by the police and 11 uh, white people killed by the police. So if, you, far this if, year. if you use those numbers, uh, that's 85% of that population is white, 15% of that population is black. But if you actually look at the deaths according to the numbers you just gave, 42% of the deaths are African American and 58% are white. That is a glaring disparity in terms of population and I just give you those numbers well not not necessarily because, because I have to adjust it by who by the you know the race of the criminal no I, I just did that for you I'm using your numbers and according to your numbers African Americans are four or five times more likely uh, than their percentage of the population to be killed by police than their no, white well, counterparts the actual, the, I, I just wanted to give you that based on your numbers? Actually, the studies I've seen have suggested two things. One, that in fact, uh, 
police are less likely uh, to shoot at a black suspect, a little bit more likely to shoot at white. However, that black that police are are more inclined to use non-lethal force in a uh, contact with an African American suspect. So those are the those in, in terms of the statistics. That's what it looks like to me. Any data that you have that shows that. <clears throat> African Americans are less likely to die at the hands of police or be shot or shot at. Uh, to me, is a a incorrect uh, analysis. But I am interested in seeing it. So if you have it, please see it. I won't call it any names. But if that data exists, I would be more than happy to see it. And since you're sending me that data, can you send me the data of African Americans within the Department of Justice? How many you have in leadership ranks all the way down? Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I would remind Mr. Jordan, Mr. Biggs, and Mr. Johnson to stop violating the rules of the committee, to stop violating the safety of the members of the committee, to stop um, holding themselves out as not caring by refusing to wear their masks. Is it permissible it, it, to drink? It is, it is not permissible. Not, not to drink. We can't drink. I'm getting ready to ask questions now. Getting ready to ask Mr. Um, and I will. <laughs> Mr. Gates is ready now. No, no, no. He's no he, went. He, he went, and that's why I took off my mask, my, Mr. My, Chairman. My, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Okay. Mr. Jordan is recognized. Mr. Attorney General, let's clear up a few things. Judge Berman Jackson agreed with your uh, with your Stone sentencing recommendation. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, and she said, I am concerned seven to nine years would be greater than necessary. I agree with the defense and with the government's second memorandum. So it couldn't be more clear they agreed with you. Right. Lafayette Square, would St. John's Church be standing today if you had not taken action? Well, I think it, uh, that was on Sunday. That was on Sunday night, and I think law enforcement did use tear gas. And my understanding is that night to clear the way so that the fire trucks could get in to, to uh, save St. John's Church. The church is that was on Sunday night, though. Understand, understand the time frame. But it would you, would it be standing today if there had not been action taken by uh, federal law enforcement and local law enforcement? Right. 38 people unmasked Michael Flynn's name 49 times in a two month time frame. Seven people at the Treasury Department unmasked Michael Flynn's name. Is this an issue that Mr. Durham is looking into? <clears throat> I've asked another U.S. attorney to look into the issue of unmasking because of, you know, the high number of unmaskings and some that do not readily appear to have been um, in the line of normal business. Wait a minute. So I want to be clear. So there is a there is another investigation on that issue specifically going on at the Justice Department right now. Yes. Wow, that's great. I, I, so Mr. Durham is looking at how the whole Trump Russia thing started. You have another U.S. attorney. Can you give us that U.S. attorney's name, or is that something you're comfortable doing? Or? John Bash of Texas. John Bash of Texas is looking specifically at the fact at unmasking. 38 people, 49 times, unmasked Michael Flynn's name and probably other unmaskings that took place in the final days of the Obama-Biden administration. Is that accurate? Actually, a much longer period of time. Even before that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. I, I appreciate that. That's information that the committee did not uh, did not know. Are peaceful protests violent, Mr. Attorney General? No. Do peaceful protests destroy businesses? No. Do peaceful protests injure officers? No. Do peaceful protests attack civilians? No. Do peaceful protests burn down buildings? No. I was, you know, the, the video we played, it's hard to watch. It's really hard to watch to see that happening in our great country. But there was what one, the, the start of it was almost laughable where you have the reporter saying, as a building is burning behind him, it's not generally speaking an unruly protest. It's mostly just a protest. I mean, it's almost laughable when you have the reporter saying, I guess, I guess he's saying it's not a fire, it's just a burning building. I guess he's saying it's a peaceful burning building. Um, a few weeks ago, well, let me ask you this. I'm, I, I wanna go right to this. Is defunding the police a rational policy? No, I, I think if anything, uh, I'm more concerned that the, the police be adequately funded today and, and get more resources. A lot of the things we need to do to address uh, some of the concerns people have about what they saw in Minneapolis are going to take some resources, some of the training uh, that we have to do. 
And uh, one of the difficulties in our country, it's not a difficulty, it's a fact, we have 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Some, most of them are very, very small. And so we have to find a way of, of training, uh, you know, making sure the training is pushed out. Is it dangerous? Dangerous to defund the police? Extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. And some of the ordinances you're seeing cities pass are also dangerous. Are you familiar with the letter that Chief of Police of Seattle, Carmen Best, sent to business owners and residents in that city? Yes, I am saying that, you know, she cannot protect, uh, she can't do her job. Her police force cannot do the job because- That's exactly what she said. Yeah. Gives officers the po policy they're trying to pass. Thank goodness the court stopped it. The policy they're trying to pass gives officers no ability, and she emphasized, no, not us, not, not you, Mr. Train, not me, gives officers no ability to safely intercede to preserve property in the midst of large, violent crowds. She also said in that letter, and again, she's, she's taken the leadership and responsibility to tell the business owners, the, the citizens, that she's supposed to serve. She also tells him that letter, I've done my due diligence on informing the council numerous times. So she's saying, I tried to tell them, these, these people won't listen to me. And then finally she says this, and this is the scary part. This is why it's so dangerous. She says this in her letter, Seattle police will have an adjusted deployment. That's a nice way of saying you're on your own. We can't help you. That is how scary this defund the police. And here's the kicker, here's the kicker. These same cities sent you a letter last week, the same week uh, Chief of Police Best does this to the re residents and citizens of, of her city. Her mayor sends you a letter blaming you, blaming the federal government for the violence that is happening in these cities. That, that, that is how ridiculous the left's position has become. I appreciate the work you're doing, Mr. Attorney General. I'm, I'm over time, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields to Mr. Jeffries. Uh, Mr. Barr, the job of the Attorney General is to defend the best interests of the people and serve as the people's lawyer. But during your time as Attorney General, you have consistently undermined democracy, undermined the Constitution, and undermined the health, safety, and well-being of the American people, all to personally benefit Donald Trump. Now, you just testified that there's no mechanism for a president to contest an election that has clearly been won by the opponent. Mr. Attorney General, what will you do if Donald Trump loses the election on November 3rd, but refuses to leave office on January 20th? If, well, if the results are clear, uh, I would leave office. Do you believe that there is any basis or legitimacy to Donald Trump's recent claim that he can't provide an answer as to whether he would leave office? I really am not familiar with these comments or the context in which they occurred, so I'm, I'm not gonna give commentary on them. Okay, thank you. He just stated that publicly about a week ago to Fox uh, News. Mr. Barr, during a radio interview this spring with Hugh Hewitt, you praised President Trump's coronavirus response as superb, correct? Who did? You did. Okay. Over 150,000 Americans have died. More than 4 million Americans have been infected. More than 5 million Americans have lost their health care. Over 100,000 small businesses have permanently closed. More than 50 million Americans are out of work. This is not the outcome of superb leadership. What we've gotten from Donald Trump is exactly the opposite. Right. Let's explore. Well, I disagree with that. that, that that was not a question, that was a statement. Let's explore. In February, President Trump falsely claimed that the number of coronavirus cases would go from 15 to zero in a few days. Was that superb, yes or no? I, I'd have to see the context in which it was said. Here's the context. Well, the number uh, of cases didn't go down to zero. It's over four million. Let's go to March. In that month, President Trump said, I take no responsibility at all for the failure in testing. Was that superb? Yes or no? It was accurate. The, the, the problem with the testing system was a function of President Obama's mishandling of the CDC and his efforts to uh, centralize everything in the CDC. When it, could, thank you, it, thank you, Mr. Barr. Yes. That is inaccurate. That's a myth. And it wasn't until this That's administration. It wasn't until claiming my time. In April, President Trump irresponsibly suggested that the American people inject themselves with bleach. Was that superb? That's, yes or no? That's not what I heard. That's exactly what he said. 
That's what the American people heard, and you know it, and you can't defend it. Let's move on to May. In that month, on National Nurses Day, President Trump falsely called PPE shortages fake news, while nurses and other healthcare professionals resorted to wearing trash bags and ski goggles to protect themselves. Fake news. Was that superb? Yes or no? I think the administration did a good job of, of mustering PPE and, and, and the national supply of PPE was run down during the Obama administration and never replaced. Thank you, Mr. Barr. The answer is no, it was not superb. By June, President Trump irresponsibly continued to refuse to wear a mask despite the public health guidance from his own experts. Was that superb? Yes or no? Which guidance? The earlier guidance that the masks wouldn't work? You know exactly the guidance that we're talking about. The CDC and Dr. Fauci in April recommended that the American people wear masks but Donald Trump has become the poster boy for the anti-mask okay, movement. Donald, Donald Trump has probably tested more than any other human being on the face of yeah, the earth. Mr. Barr, every... the answer is the refusal to wear a mask is not superb. Last question. In July, President Trump falsely claimed that 99% of COVID-19 cases are, quote, totally harmless. Was that superb? Yes or no? I think essentially what he was saying is that the, the fatality rate relatively is very low, very low. The answer is 150,000 Americans are dead. It has been a failure of epic proportions. In fact, Donald Trump's response to the coronavirus pandemic has been the worst failure of any president in American history. And the American people have paid the price. I yield back. Gentlemen, he goes back and seeks recognition. Well, I'm, I guess I do. If it's, I think it's my turn to speak and ask Gentlemen's questions. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Then I seek recognition, sir. Gentlemen, recognized. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. Um, Attorney General Barr, Chairman Nadler opened up his statement by saying you can no longer hide behind a legal fiction. That... That caused me some consternation. I had no idea what he was talking about. Do you have any idea what he's talking about? I don't recall that phrase and in what context. Well, who knows what context? I mean, he was just kind of rattling on there that uh, he was he was uh, uh, attacking you and your performance and virtually everything he could and said, you can no longer hide behind a legal fiction. Um, and I didn't see any connection with anything else he had been saying. So I wondered if you had seen anything. Apparently, you didn't see anything either. Um, the next person to ask questions was the gentlelady from California who consistently referred to uh, civilian federal agents as federal troops and intimating, if you will, that uh, Portland was peaceable until federal civilian agents arrived on the scene. Essentially, it's kind of analogous to blaming a fire department for showing up to put out a fire and then being blamed for starting the fire. Attorney General Barr, let's just have it on the record. Was there violence and attempts to burn down, vandalize the building and attack um, civilian employees of the federal government prior to any other federal agents or the reinforcements being sent in of federal agents? Yeah, my recollection is our, our main effort to reinforce was around the 4th of July period and it had been going on for quite a while before that. Let's talk about Lafayette Square for a second. Um, the, uh, leading up to June 1st, you had violent mobs disobeying the 11 p.m. curfew. They set fire to parked cars, demolished coffee shops and banks, burned American flags, and even intentionally set fire to St. John's Episcopal Church near Lafayette Square. Secret Service and, and uh, Park Police appropriate use of safe restorative force um, actually cleared that up. In total, however, 51 U.S. Park Police officers were injured during the weekend leading up to the perimeter expansion. Can you, do you want to expand on right. on the actions regarding Lafayette Park? Right, so for the 29th, 30th, and 31st, there was unprecedented uh, rioting right around uh, the White House, uh, very violent. During that time, as you say, about 50 park police and a comparable number is my recollection of Secret Service 
so we had about nine, I think around 90 uh, officers injured. I'm talking about things like concussions, uh, one was operated on and so forth. Uh, we had the president, it was so bad that as it's been reported, uh, the Secret Service recommended the president go down to the shelter. We had a breach of the Treasury Department. Uh, the, the historical building on, on Lafayette Park was burned down, the lodge. Uh, St. Uh, John's was, uh, was set on fire. Uh, bricks were thrown at the police repeatedly. They took crowbars and pried up the pavers at, on Lafayette Park and threw those at the police. Balloons of caustic liquid were thrown on the police. And uh, it was clear when I arrived at the White House on Monday, uh, there was total consensus that the, we couldn't allow that to happen uh, so close to the White House, uh, that kind of rioting. And therefore, we had to move the perimeter out uh, one block and push it up toward I Street. And there was already a plan in being at that point that the Park Police and the Secret Service had worked out the night before, uh, which was to put the perimeter further away and then give them time to put a non-scalable fence across the northern part of uh, the park. During the day, during Monday, the, uh, the factors that led to the timing of it were uh, that that movement was going to be made as soon as there were enough uh, units in place to actually perform it, and units were very slow in getting into place throughout the day, much to my frustration because I wanted it moved uh, before there was a big buildup of demonstrators. Uh, and also the fencing had to be delivered. And when those things were accomplished, the tactical uh, commander in charge of the park police uh, proceeded with the with the movement of pushing the uh, the perimeter. So this was this was something conceived of long before and didn't turn on the, the nature of the crowd. Although I would say the crowd was very unruly, and and while the tactical considerations were made by the park police. Uh, you know, they, they tried to respond to the situation. To say that this had to do uh, with the photo op is, you know, and I don't mean to analogize this to a military operation, but it's akin to saying that we invaded the Philippines in World War II so Douglas MacArthur could walk through the surf on the beach. One follows the other, but we did not invade the Philippines so that Douglas MacArthur could walk to the beach. Thank you. You. General Neal's back, uh, Mr. Swallow. Mr. Barr, have you ever intervened other than to help the president's friend get a reduced prison sentence for any other case where a prosecutor had filed a sentencing recommendation with the court? A sentencing recommendation? Yeah. Have you ever intervened other than that case with the president's friend? Not that I recall. If you're talking, does that seem like something you recall? Where you would? Well, I'm, I'm saying I can't really remember my first. If you let me finish the question, I, I, I can't That's remember. Big, Thirty yeah. years ago, I was attorney general. As attorney general now. Uh, but uh, no, I didn't. But that's because issues come up to the attorney general within a dispute, and I have never heard of a dispute. I've never heard of a dispute in the department Mr. where Barr. line prosecutors threaten to quit well, uh, because, because, and they, they with because of a because of a Barr, discussion over sentencing. Americans from both this. parties are concerned that in Donald Trump's America, there's two systems of justice: one for Mr. Trump and his cronies, and another for the rest of us. But that can only happen if you enable it. At your confirmation hearing, you were asked, do you believe a president could lawfully issue a pardon in exchange for the recipient's promise to not incriminate him? You said... No, not, not to what? That would be a crime. You were asked, could a president issue a pardon in exchange for the recipient's promise to not incriminate him? And you responded, no, that would be a crime. Is that right? Yes, I said that. You said a crime. You didn't say it'd be wrong. You didn't say it'd be unlawful. You said it'd be a crime. And when you said that, that a president swapping a pardon to silence the witness would be a crime, you were promising the American people that if you saw that, you would do something about it. Is that right? That's right. Now, Mr. Barr, are you investigating Donald Trump for commuting the prison sentence of his longtime friend and political advisor, Roger Stone? No. Why not? Why should I? Well, let's talk about that. Mr. Stone was convicted by a jury on seven counts of lying in the Russia investigation. He bragged that he lied to save Trump's butt. But why would he lie? Your prosecutors, Mr. Barr, told a jury that Stone lied because the truth looked bad for Donald Trump. And what truth is that? Well, Donald Trump denied in written answers to the Russia investigators that he talked to Roger Stone during the time Roger Stone was in contact with agents of a Russian influence operation. There's evidence that Trump and Stone indeed did, did talk during that time. 
you would agree that it's a federal crime to lie under oath. Is that right? Yes. It's a crime for you, it's a crime for me, and it's certainly a crime for the President of the United States. Is that right? Yes. So if Donald Trump lied to the Mueller investigators, which you agree would be a crime, then Roger Stone was in a position to expose Donald Trump's lies. Are you familiar with the December 3rd, 2018 tweet where Donald Trump said Roger Stone had shown guts by not testifying against him? No, I'm not familiar with that. You don't read the president's tweets? No. Well, there's a lot of evidence in the president's tweets, Mr. Attorney General. I think you should start reading them because he said Mr. Stone showed guts. But on July 10 of this year, Roger Stone declared to a reporter, I had 29 or 30 conversations with Trump during the campaign period. Trump knows I was under enormous pressure to turn on him. It would have eased my situation considerably, but I didn't. The prosecutors wanted me to play Judas. I refused. Are you familiar with that Stone statement? Actually, I'm not. So how can you sit here and tell us why should I investigate the president of the United States if you're not even aware of the facts concerning the president using the pardon or commutation power to swap the silence of a witness? Because we, we require uh, you know, a reliable predicate before we open a criminal investigation. And I just gave you some... I, I don't consider it. I consider it a very Rube uh, Goldberg theory that you have. Well, it, it sounds like you're hearing this... And, and by the way, if I apply, if I apply this Attorney standard, General, there'd, be a lot, there'd be a lot more people under investigation. Ah. Mr. Attorney General, the very same day that Roger Stone said that, Donald Trump... That's one of the no the, surprise. The, the true two standards, standards of justice were really so, during the tail end of the Obama. Mr. Attorney General, let's turn to the Michael Cohen case. Are you aware, sir, that Michael Cohen, after being released from prison, was asked to not engage with the media, including to write a book? Were you aware that that was going to be asked of him? Was I aware? Yes. No. Do you know if anyone else in your department was aware? Uh, maybe I should tell you what happened. Why don't you tell us what happened? Okay. He was furloughed from the Bureau of Prisons. No, no. Why don't you tell us why he was asked? I will tell you. Agreement not because to something that people don't seem to understand is that his home confinement was not being supervised by the Bureau of Prisons. It, was, Bureau being, of Prisons. it was being supervised by the probation office, which is part of the U.S. court system. And Are it was the U.S. court system that had the requirements of that and not yes, writing. That U.S. court system called your actions retaliatory. Do you uh, agree with that? No, so all I know is what I what has been said in court before the judge and in the record, Mr. which Buck is that the individual uh, was then called by the U.S. court system, saying that this guy Cohen is uncooperative; he's not agreeing to the conditions. And at that point, a Bureau of Prisons person made the decision that he was no longer eligible for home confinement. Conditions that a federal judge said no other inmate had ever been asked of in his experience. Mr. Barr, you told ABC News that the president's tweets sometimes make your job impossible. But sir, your job is only impossible if you enable the president's corrupt schemes. Now you'll back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, Mr. Attorney General, the Constitution says the president shall have the power uh, to grant uh, uh, reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. Do you note any other limitations in the Constitution on the president's power to pardon? No. Has the president exceeded that power? No. Uh, my uh, colleague from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, implied that uh, in challenging the sentencing recommendation of Roger Stone, you were doing the bidding of the president. He, he didn't want to hear your response. I, I would. Well, no, I was uh, uh, Roger Stone. I never discussed our sentencing recommendation with anyone outside the Department of Justice. It was a very condensed period of time. I first heard, I made the decision that we shouldn't take a position as to the, the precise uh, a sentence that should leave it up to the judge, and we should not affirmatively advocate for seven to nine years, and I made that uh, on Monday the 10th, and that that night we filed, the department filed, and it didn't reflect what I had decided, so that night I told people we had to fix it first thing in the morning. Uh, so uh, we did. As soon as I got in, we 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 went for, we went forward with a plan to file. At that point, I learned about the president's tweet because I don't monitor the president's tweets, uh, and I hesitated because I knew that I would be attacked for doing it. Uh, and people would make the you know argue that I did it because of the tweet, but I felt at the end of the day I really had to go forward. Uh, with our filing because it was the right thing to do, and I'm glad the judge agreed with it. 
uh, we're learning more and more about the targeting and prosecution and, and extortion of Michael Flynn by partisan officials at the FBI. No one has been held accountable for this grotesque abuse of power. Um, knowing that agents with a political agenda can take anything that someone says, edit it, misrepresent it, prosecute it, and then extort confessions by threatening family members, and to do so with impunity, why would anyone in his right mind ever want to talk to an FBI agent again? Well, I, I don't, you know, I haven't reached judgments, and I'm not suggesting that all those facts you set forth are, are true, and, I, and we have not, uh, at this point, uh, uh, challenged the actions of, I defended the actions of the prosecutors in this case in court, uh, my, my, the order of business right now uh, is knowing what we know now, uh, we don't think any uh, of the U.S. attorneys in the department would have prosecuted this case, uh, partly because of the behavior of the FBI, but also because the evidence is not there to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And part of what I'm trying to uh, establish is that we will use the same standards for everybody before we indict anybody. And this goes for every, both sides. Uh, we won't prosecute anyone, anybody unless there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed a crime. And not some kind of esoteric made up crime, but a meat and potatoes crime. Um, for more than three years, the most powerful agencies in our government took information three but a meat and potatoes crime. Give anyone, anybody, unless there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed a crime. And not some kind of esoteric made up crime, but a meat and potatoes crime. Um, for more than three years, the most powerful agencies in our government took information that was fabricated by agents of a political campaign that they knew was fraudulent, used it as justification to launch an investigation alleging treason against a presidential candidate then leaked the existence of that investigation in a manner that was clearly calculated to affect the outcome of the election. And then failing that, used it in a largely successful attempt to obstruct the duly elected president. Are you gonna be able to, to right this wrong before it becomes a precedent for future election interference by corrupt officials in our justice and intelligence agencies? You know, I, I really can't predict that. I think, uh, as you know, uh, John Durham is looking at all these matters. Uh, COVID did delay that action for a while, but he's working very diligently. And, you know, justice is not something you order up on a, a schedule like you're ordering a pizza. You know, there are many of us who are concerned that if you are succeeded by someone like Keith Ellison uh, as attorney general, uh, uh, that this will become an institutionalized practice and the investigation of Mr. Durham will simply go away. I understand your concern. Uh, one more thing. A term we keep hearing from the left is, oh, these are mostly peaceful protests, mostly peaceful. It seems to me that you either are or you're not. Uh, calling what's happening in our cities mostly peaceful. I'm going to stop right there and weigh in on that. In my view, that's what happens in a lot of these confrontational issues are moments in government is that they'll hang it up in court to the point that it never gets tried, it never gets heard and then whenever the next administration comes in power it suddenly gets dropped or it don't get taken care of and it's a matter of being unreliable and unaccountable and it's basically like kicking the can down the road that will continue to move this it's it's almost like how, how can I explain it to where you make and understand it it's almost like trying to it's trying like a, a, a bait a a basketball team trying to win a championship okay and they keep winning every time they play winning every time they play even though there's lots of defects in the men that are women that's playing the game and it really don't show its tail until the very last 
one or two games. In the very last one or two games is whenever it tells the tale towards who is actually the better team. And those imperfections, those inadequacies now come out. Well, if the government continues to keep the game going and they don't never reconcile, it don't never get brought out to the open because they keep it pushed far enough back to keep moving that goalpost again and again throughout every administration to the point that the whole truth, nothing but the truth, really never gets presented before we the people. Because if it did, it would be earth shattering to a lot of these administrations that have got in there and have made a mess out of the job that they have made. So rather than them to be ridiculed or even mocked, they keep playing the catch-up game towards kicking the can down the road, hoping, hoping, hoping that no one will notice. That's the very reason why that we're in the shape that we're in right now, is because that they have played this game towards rolling it over, rolling it over, moving the goalposts, moving the goalposts, to the point that nobody actually becomes accountable for their mistakes. And it's really, really sad because it's the very thing that's put us in the shape that we're in right now towards being trillions and trillions of dollars in debt and all these problems that has now come to the majority of the people here in America coming to their living rooms and coming to their livelihoods, coming near a neighborhood near you, just like the Walmart slogan. It's really sad. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to throw my opinion in here because I believe this is just about over with. Or it is going to be for my interview anyway. Then all of a sudden you have somebody like Trump that sees these problems initiating. He brings in the goon squads that's to try to put the fire out or to eliminate the fire from jumping over into another region or another city and the next thing you know Trump himself gets accused of initiating the problem to begin with. How sick is that for a society that's not willing to stand up and be accountable for its own actions and its own sins to have the blame game going to the point that we're going to keep, continue to keep kicking the can down the road towards chaotic, chaotic, chaos, and more chaoticacy. How sick is that? Because eventually there's going to be a reconcilable day. And we're at that reconcilable day pertaining to Judgment Day. And now it's going across the board wide and far towards what's actually happening. We have a bunch of stiffs that's in the positions right now in local, state, and federal governments that shouldn't be in there, that should have been disqualified or taken out. I'm going to go as far as say 12, 15, 20, 25 years ago. They should have been taken out because they was all playing the same I got you, it ain't my fault game. I'll tag you, but it will be after the next administration comes into play. Well, after the next administration comes into play, what difference does it make if you tagged them or not? Now you got the next, next, next administration coming into power with the next roll of, of troubles. Coming, coming into play. In other words, it's like uh, dominoes. One, one thing affects another thing. One thing adds to another thing. One problem adds to another problem. It's sickening of how that this government is being run right now, and I truly believe that our forefathers, our builders, 
out of the inadequacies that has been going on in the past 25 or 30 years did not intend for this government to run the way that this government is being run right now. I'm going to leave it at that. A protest is a lot like calling Scott Peterson a mostly faithful husband or Al Capone a mostly law-abiding businessman. Um, there is a constitutional right to peaceably assemble. Where does that right stop? When it becomes violent, criminal activity. You know, that's the challenge here. I mean, uh, you have a lot of people who are out protesting and demonstrating, and that's uh, important First Amendment activity that we believe strongly in and try to protect. Uh, and uh, the particular violent opportunists that are involved here get into those crowds and then start engaging in very violent activity and, and hijack it. And a lot of protesters have been telling law enforcement and providing information to us about these people who are not with them, they're not demonstrators, but they're coming in. And a lot of demonstrators leave when that happens because they can see what's happening themselves. Would you call that violence a myth? The gentleman's time, no. the gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barr, for being here today. I'd like to ask you some questions about the legal standard for seizing and arresting protesters. Uh, under the Fourth Amendment, it requires probable cause before you can seize and arrest a protester, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. and. The probable cause has to be particularized to a particular person. So if a protester was merely standing around in a crowd in the vicinity of someone else suspected of criminal activity, you cannot arrest that peaceful protester. In other words, there's no such thing as probable cause by mere association, correct? Well, not strictly, but I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, you do need particularized probable cause. Okay, and if there's no probable cause, if someone jumps into a getaway pastor, car right? and there are three or four people in there, that might be enough to give you probable cause, just those circumstances. Mm -hmm. you, you don't need it on each Re individual. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Attorney General. If there is no probable cause, you can't arrest a protester, correct? I said at the beginning, arrest has to be predicated on probable cause. All right. Now, an arrest can also occur whether or not the federal official says it's an arrest. So, for example, if a federal officer takes a protester into custody, transport that protester, let's say, to a federal building, detains a person for questioning, that will constitute an arrest whether or not the federal official says the person's under arrest, correct? Well, that would require a very intensive in, uh, review of all the specifics involved. Uh, actually, it wouldn't. Uh, in the case of Dunaway versus New York, which is black letter law for over 40 years, the question is whether the police violated the Fourth and Fifteenth Amendments when, without probable cause to arrest, they took petitioners into custody, transported him to a police station, and detained him for questioning. The answer is yes, that would constitute an no, arrest. No, the answer is that, you know, Fourth Amendment is ultimately governed by reasonableness, and it, there can be circumstances. The, the question sometimes is when does something actually become custody? Reclaiming my time, I'm cite this is not a trick question. Mr. Barr, I'm just citing you what the Supreme Court said. So here's a problem. Under this standard black letter law, which has been in effect for over 40 years, what the federal forces in Portland did was unconstitutional. Federal forces in full combat gear, in the dark of night, grabbed a protester who was peacefully standing there, forced him into an unmarked van, drove him to a separate location, searched him, detained him and questioned him. That is what police states do. That's what authoritarian yeah, regimes do. But I don't do. think those were the facts. That's not, I haven't asked you a question yet, Mr. Barr. Okay. What the federal, federal officials did was illegal because they didn't have probable cause. How do we know that? Because Deputy Director of the Federal Protective Service, Chris Klein, admitted it on national TV. Deputy Director Klein said that the individual that they were questioning was in a crowd and in an area where another individual was aiming a laser at the eyes of officers. That's guilt by association. That's what the Fourth Amendment prohibits. Deputy Director Klein further stated that the protester was released after federal officials concluded, quote, they did not have what they needed, unquote, which again shows there's no probable cause.
And it can't. I want to stop right there and say something. Whenever it comes to a group of people that's a few of them are actively committing crimes and breaking law, there's really no way that the other people cannot wiggle or work out of insanity pleas by pleading the fifth by saying, well, we didn't see them do that, or we don't know who done that. The fact of the matter is they did see who done that. And because they seen who done that, and they know that that had gotten occurred during the time that they was in that group of people, they become an accessory to that crime. Because yes, they're guilty by association. They should have retreated once they realized that those people that they was with was committing crimes, regardless whether it was breaking out windows, regardless whether it was being violent, regardless whether it was burning down buildings, once they realized that they was with the wrong crowd, they should have retreated. They should have went back and done something different. Or, better than that, they should have got on the phone and contacted the local judicial uh, police department and said, you know what, I just got to seeing this person knock this person down, or I just got to seeing this person break out this this uh, uh, glass in this in this department building, or I just got to seeing these people run out of this this building uh, with TVs and they was looting. Uh, you know, you're, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution to the problem. There really is no no uh, gray areas here whenever you're involved in mob type activity that is committing crime. Now, if nobody is committing crime, nobody is committing crime, then there is no crime that's being committed. And if there is no crime that's being committed, then you have to look at it in the eyes of justice by saying, well, if there is no crime that's been committed, even this person that's involved with this group of people hasn't done nothing. If they're just standing there minding their own business. You see, you got to look at the dynamics of what's actually happening with the whole surrounding circumstances. And you got to take it on a case by case basis <clears throat> because each case is going to be different, each crowd is going to be different, in each state and in each city, in each case it's going to be different. But I'm telling you, once you have observed or seen a crime being committed, unless you have called the police in reporting that crime, you automatically become guilty by association in seeing that crime being committed and, of course, they're all going to lie. All of them's going to lie, or most all of them's going to lie. There's going to be very few people that's going to come forth to, to say, yeah, I actually seen that person uh, break in that window and go in there and steal that 32-inch TV. They're all going to lie for each other because it's an environment, it's a very, very toxic environment of mayhem, anarchy. It's an environment of all for one and one for all. And whenever you have this type of environment, especially if there's crimes being committed, the people that's just associated with that group can be charged. Because now, even though they wasn't the ones that actually broke out the window, they seen the window be broken out. Or they know of the person that broke out the window. Now, they're going to tell you that they didn't see who broke out the window. They're going to tell you that they don't know who broke out that window. And out, let's say out of 100 people that's with the person that broke out the window, there may be 50% of them out of the 100. There may be 50 of them that actually didn't witness that window being broken. But you have to use a little bit of common sense and understanding that even though 50 of them didn't see who broke out the window, there has to be a certain percentage of them that did see who broke out the window. Those will be the people that will be lying. The 50% that did see it will be lying and saying, we didn't see nothing. Out of sight, out of mind, we didn't see nothing. But now you got the other 50% that actually didn't see what happened, 
but they're going to tell everybody, we didn't see what happened. So what do you do whenever you have mob mentality type atmospheres like this? Uh, my opinion has always been you just go in and you do a, you do a sweep. You do a sweep and it may not be, it may not be the, uh, the most just thing to do. But I tell you, a lot of times being raised up with three other brothers and one of us was just as mean as the other and there was lots of times that we thought that we was going to watch each other's back and we was going to play Mr. Smart Guy and we wasn't going to tell nobody in who actually committed the crime. We was going to cover for each other for each other's back until my father wisened up and said, all right, if none of you's going to own up to this and none of you's going to own up in who done it, I'm fixing to whip all of you. I'm fixing to whip every one of you and discipline you just like every one of you done it. If you're not willing to own up and say which one actually done it. And you may say to yourself, well, that's a very unfair way of dealing with a mob type, type, mob type mentality. But sometimes that's the only way to deal with a mob type, type uh, uh, mentality. Because in actuality, somebody in there has to know who done it. It works the same way in your prison systems. If you got a pod where somebody gets killed. Somebody gets raped, somebody gets mutually beaten almost to death. And nobody in that pod will fess up. And they got each other's back. I didn't see nothing. I didn't see nothing. I didn't hear nothing. I was asleep. I was in the bathroom. I was doing this. I was doing that. A lot of times the warden, the person that's in charge of that jail, has to punish the whole pod. In other words, the whole pod suffers consequences because one or two people didn't come forth in cover over that type of activity. Because you know good and well, if somebody killed somebody, somebody in there had to see it or know that it happened. Now, if it's only two people in a pod, two people in a cell, and one person gets killed, it's kind of difficult sometimes to get the truth out of what actually happened because that one person could say, well, he slipped and fell, or this happened, or that happened, you know, and as long as that person is adamant in telling his story and there is no other witnesses and you can't validate or prove that that other prisoner got killed in any other way, then that one person that's in that one pod may actually get away with murder by killing that one person that's in that pod. But now if you're dealing with a group where there's witnesses, then the whole plateau of the entity changes. And what's more, you may be saying, well, to punish all of them versus not punishing none of them is not the proper form of justice. Is it not? Is it not? Is that not exactly what God the Father is doing right now to society down here upon to the earth? By bringing all these different events that's happening to us, regardless whether it's coming in the form of fires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, drugs, divorces, all these other horrible, horrible things that keep happening to families again and again and again, and now it's, it's uh, a pandemic. Is it not the fair way of dealing with a mob type mentality that if you can't just punish one, you punish all? Once more, it's based upon what I said a while ago. Whenever it rains upon to the just, providing that the rain is adequate and the rain is what people need, pertaining to it being a blessing, whenever it rains upon the just, it also rains upon the unjust. But on the same hand, whenever retribution falls from the heavens whenever retribution falls upon to the just it also falls upon to the unjust and that's the way you deal 
with a mob mentality. That's the only way to deal with all this inadequate uncertainty and all these lies and deceit. As that federal uh, deputy director client appears to understand that there was no probable cause because he essentially justifies that action as saying it wasn't an arrest. He calls it, quote, a simple engagement, unquote. I'm a former prosecutor. I've never heard that term, a simple engagement, because it's a made up excuse. What these federal officials did was an arrest. They grabbed a peaceful protester, they forced him into a van, drove him to another location, questioned him. That is exactly what the Supreme Court prohibited over 40 years. And they may have had. They may have very well had. And it may have been an innocent bystander. But how are they going to know that if they don't grab up that person and at least do an interrogation and, and a questioning type deal? And then after you question the person, you release them and you let them go on their own reconnaissance once you find out that you ain't going to get no vital information out of them. Once you realize that there's no way to you to be able to prove without a certain of a doubt that you can't prove this, then you let the person go. And it's like, okay, we'll catch you next time, buddy. Because there's no doubt, there was lots of times whenever I was drinking and carousing around back in my teenage years, I should have got a DUI. I should have got multiple DUIs by drinking and being buzzed up too much. Now, does that mean I'm going to go around beating my chest and telling everybody pertaining to the law enforcement agencies that I got away with murder? No, because I guarantee you, if I didn't get punished one way, I got punished in another way. And I tend to wonder sometimes, because of all this inadequate punishment that I have received, as a founder of a windmill ministries that sometimes I wonder if this isn't the way that the system gets back at me towards if they couldn't catch me red-handed in me being persecuted over some of the charges that I should have been charged with and persecuted for if I don't get charged with charges that I shouldn't have been charged for but I still wind up suffering persecution on account of those charges anyway. So I, I tend to wonder sometimes because it's kind of like bad karma. What goes around comes around and if you was a, a naughty naughty boy or a naughty naughty girl growing up and you thought that you was getting away with this and you thought that you was getting away with that, God has a way of showing you that you hadn't gotten away with nothing. You just thought that you was getting away with something. Kind of like, once more, Adam and Eve. The devil come to Eve. Eve thought that she got away with that. She even persuaded Adam. And there at the last, even Adam thought, well, I got away with that. Until God come back onto the scene and asked him, why did you do what I told you that you shouldn't have done? And of course, Adam blamed the woman, the woman blamed the snake, and we all know the tale in Behind Adam and Eve. Once more, mankind wants to refuse to be accountable for their own actions, which is really, really senseless, and it's really, really, uh, it shows the, the uh, trueness of mankind towards mankind thinking that they're going to be able to get away with basically all these things knowing that they're never going to get away with nothing. Once more, we've used up enough time here. This is fixing to go off. My phone is fixing to go out. I've used up basically all my battery time. So whenever this does finally go off pretending to my phone shutting down, I don't want to go off the air uh, irresponsibly or to go off the air in an un- professional way so I'm going to go and go ahead and tell my viewers right now good luck to all of us as we go forth in representing each other and as we try to initiate justice and fairness to all people and hopefully in the future we can create that more perfect better union regarding all these instrumentation devices in regards to living in a digital society. We're just going to play this and let it play out as long as it'll play out and let you listen to the remaining parts of this.
is the go. So and I obviously, incident. I obviously don't know the that. Washington Post, I'm, I haven't asked you a question yet. In a Washington Post article on July 24th entitled Operation Diligent Valor, federal agents told reporters that there's no basis for these arrests. They said, quote, at times they have grabbed an individual and taken them inside the courthouse for questioning before determining that they had no probable cause to charge them with any crime, unquote. W. Director Klein said that they um, coordinate with the U.S. Attorney's Office on all of these arrests. I urge you to instruct your federal officials to comply with the Constitution. And I ask you to investigate these arrests because many of them are in violation of the Fourth Amendment. We do not live in a police state. We're better than that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since Representative Lou didn't allow you any time to answer his allegations, would you care to answer any of his allegations? Yes, I mean, obviously, I, I don't know all the particulars of any individual case out there, but uh, based on my general understanding, uh, what had happened uh, was that when they tried to effectuate arrests of the ringleaders or the people who were engaged in violence or that they saw with lasers and so forth, and they went out, they were immediately swarmed by people in black and there was a lot of violence, so they couldn't effectuate the rest. So the modus operandi was changed, and based on uh, specific information as the individuals who were seen doing things and identified, they later tried to pick them up uh, when there was less of a risk of this kind of mob response. The fact that you, if you have information uh, that someone has a laser and is using it and later pick him up and he doesn't have it, it doesn't mean that there wasn't probable cause. It means he doesn't have the laser. The question is, you know, was it reasonable for you to rely on the information that you had and the identification of that individual? In some cases, it could be a misidentification. In other cases, it could be the person, you know, ditched the laser. So there is a distinction between whether the person ultimately can be shown to have violated the law and whether there was probable cause for the police to make the inquiry and, and, and take them and, and interrogate them or ask them questions at least. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. You know, I think, um, I have to tell you, you probably know this, my constituents are scared. Americans are scared. I mean, they watch the TV, they see all this rioting, looting going on, statues being torn down uh, in Arizona where I'm from, more guns are being sold than ever. I think there's more new gun owners uh, than ever. And uh, this has to stop. And I think that it's really important, as the saying goes, that in order to solve a problem, the first step is to realize there's a problem. And so it always, I find it very disturbing, should I say, that Chairman Nadler d denies that Antifa even exists. He said it to a reporter. Um, he said on the floor of the Uni United States House of Representatives that it was a fantasy, a made up fantasy. Uh, and then in this very room just recently, Congresswoman Jaya Paul, who represents the Seattle area said, when I was talking about the autonomous zone and the takeover, um, she said, the area is just a few miles from where I sit right now, and there is no takeover. There is no takeover. Uh, she also said, lies are being spread by my colleagues in this committee. This area is perfectly peaceful. Um, she also said, my Republican colleagues keep saying the Seattle police precinct was taken over by protesters. This is incorrect. Incorrect. No one has taken over that building. Um, Mr. Attorney General, is that your understanding of what happened there? Do, do you agree with Ms. Jayapal that there was no takeover? It was just Jayapal. If you're going to say my name, please say it right. It's Jayapal. Jayapal, do you, would you agree with that? And also, in answer, why do you think these autonomous zones in Democrat-led cities are dangerous to America? Well, starting with the, uh, they're dangerous because uh, they are 